Well, welcome. My name is Stephanie Caldwell, and I'm the President and CEO of the Ventura Chamber of Commerce, and it is my honor and pleasure to welcome all of you here today uh, for our third annual State of Education event. Uh, we are so thrilled to be here, and we've got some great speakers for you that I know you're going to be very interested in hearing what they have to say. This year, we decided to take a little bit different approach to our State of Education. Um, in the past, we've always had kind of a specific subject or issue that we wanted to tackle and talk about as a group. But this year, with so much going on in education, we felt that it was important to touch base with each of these three institutions and hear a little bit more about what's happening, what's coming. Um, I know there are a lot of changes uh, in the future here. And then we asked each of them to finish with, uh, by answering a specific question. And that question is, given the goals and, and objectives that you have for the coming year, how can the business community help you achieve those goals? So we really want this to be kind of the start of a conversation that continues not only for the next 12 months, but beyond that. And every year we hope to build on that relationship and those discussions to really you know, ingrain even more of the business community into our educational institutions. You know, it struck me this morning as I was preparing for today, um, our former board chair, James Perero, sitting right over there. James, wave your hand. James has a very adorable little daughter, and her name is Sadie, and she just started kindergarten this last year. Uh, started in Ventura Unified School District, one of the great schools that we have here. And I was thinking about Sadie just starting her education and career. Um, I, I thought, gosh, you know, what is it going to be like when she graduates high school, when she graduates college? We've all heard that when Sadie graduates and goes out to get her first job in the real world, the technology that she's going to be employing hasn't even been invented yet. That's a tall task for our educators to tackle. And I know it's one that they've given a lot of thought to, and they have a lot of uh, thoughts about how we handle that and how we work together. And so it's really in that spirit of collaboration that we move forward with this event today. So I do have a few folks that I'd like to um, thank before I introduce um, our board chair this year. Uh, and some of those folks, uh, I believe, just walked in the room. So um, representing the city of Ventura, we have Mayor, Mayor Eric Nazarenko right in the back. Thank you. <laughs> Representing Congresswoman Julia Brownlee, we have Jason Barnes. <laughs> Representing Senator Hannah Beth Jackson, we have Will Lorenzen. <laughs> Representing Assemblymember Jackie Irwin, we have Jeanette Sanchez. Representing Assemblymember Monique Lamone, we have Angelica Cisneros. <laughs> Representing Supervisor Steve Bennett, we have Steve Offerman. <laughs> and then we have several representatives from our Ventura Unified School District Board. Uh, please welcome Mary Hafner. <laughs> Jackie Moran. and Sabrina Rodriguez. Now, a few folks that are near and dear to my heart are our Chamber Board of Directors. So if you are on the Chamber Board, if you could please stand and be recognized. Thank you so much for being here today. And with that, Nan, don't sit down, because I'm going to call you up to the podium. Uh, please welcome Nan Drake, our 2017 Board Chair. My role today was supposed to be very small. I have five pages, so uh, <clears throat> bear with me. But first of all, you wouldn't be here today if you didn't understand the importance of the educational community and the business working together. Um, you, we know that we can't accomplish anything unless we really understand the needs, and that is one reason that we're sitting all here together. Um, we want to bring success to our children. They need to not only be prepared for a job, but they need to be prepared for life. And to do that, they need more than just job skills. They need understanding of how to be a good parent, how to get along with others, and all of this they can learn very easy in the classroom. So we're today gathered to make sure that we, the chamber, and the business community as a whole understands these needs and works very closely. Because if we want nothing else for our children, we want them to be safe, and we want them to have the skills that make not only 
them job happy, because that's very important to be happy in your job place, but to understand there's more to life than just working, and we want them to be part of this whole beautiful universe that we live in, understand the arts, understand the importance of education for their children. So with that, we're going to hear from some experts um, that are going to tell us how we can make our children be successful and happy for a lifetime. Now, uh, I'd also like to um, uh, recognize some people, our partners, and please do not applaud to each one. Let's wait till the very end because the list is very, very long and you recognize most of these names anyway. So uh, our partners, California State University Channel Islands, Ventura College and Ventura Unified School District. Our platinum sponsors are Patagonia, Ventura Auto Center, strangers, right? Don't know these people. Gulf sponsors, Era Energy, California State University Channel Islands, Kaiser Permanente. Bronze sponsors, Crown Plaza Ventura Beach, Gold Coast Acura, Myers, Witters, Gibson, Jones, and Fine Gold. Tolman and Weicker Insurance Services, Western States Petroleum Association. Media sponsors are Caps Media, Don Holmes Photo, Gold Coast Broadcasting, Lunar's Production Services, Pacific Coast Business Times, VC Reporter, Ventura Breeze, and the Ventura County Star. Uh, recognition now of our Chairman Circle members at the Platinum level, Ventura Auto Center, Four Points Sheridan at the Gold level, AT&T, Community Memorial Health Services, Kaiser Permanente, and at the Silver, silver level, Aero Energy, Montecito Bank of Trust, take a breath, at the Bronze level, California Resources Corporation, CSU Channel Islands, Crown Plaza Ventura Beach, E.J. Harrison & Sons, Gold Coast Acura, Gold Coast Transit, Hofer Enterprises, Marriott Beach Ventura, Mortgage Couch, Myers, Witters, Gibson, Jones & Feingo, Pacific Western Bank, Patagonia, Southern California Edison, Swift Chip, Tolman & Weicker Insurance Services, Union Bank, Ventura Community Bank, Ventura County Credit Union, Ventura Rental Party Center, Western States Petroleum Association, and at the media level, Caps Media, Gold Coast Broadcasting, Lunar's Production Services, Pacific Coast Business Times, VC Reporter, Ventura Breeze, Ventura County Star, and many thanks to Ventura College for hosting us today. Now you may apply. Ah, now it comes to our very first speaker, and I would like to introduce Mr. Joseph Richards, Jr. And I, I have to read this about you. Come on up and join me. <laughs> Joe is the in interim superintendent of the Ventura Unified School District, attended California State University, Los Angeles, and graduated with a degree in business administration and accounting. He received his master's degree in negotiations, conflict resolution, and peacemaking from California State University, Dominguez Hills. Mr. Richards, Richards has worked in the field of business for approximately 41 years, eight years in financial institutions, and over 32 years in school business. Prior to serving as the interim superintendent, he served as the deputy superintendent of business services, assistant superintendent of business services, and the Director of Budget and Finance for the Unified School District. Mr. Richards is a firm believer in giving back, thus he has served on many community boards in our beautiful community and in other communities. With that, I think I'm going to let you talk. How's that? The list is long of all he's done. Just make one quick second. Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> While she sets that up, um, I, I do want to also say that I, I'm a product of public education and went to uh, schools in LA Unified School District. I went to 36th Street Elementary School, James A. Foshe Junior High School, and then I went to Susan Miller Dorsey High School in, in, in Los Angeles. And of course you've heard that I've gone through the California State University system as well. And so I have uh, benefited highly from public education. and. Uh, really know the value of it and, and, and how important it is to communities. 
And so we are Ventura Unified School District. Ventura Unified School District was established in 1966, and then I kind of gave a, an indication of our boundaries. And so our, our western boundaries go all the way up to La Conchita. Um, our northern boundary is the Oakview Ojai border. Southern boundary is the Santa Clara River, and the eastern boundary is the Ellsworth Barranca, which is almost to uh, Santa Paula. Three of our board members have been introduced. This year, Velma Lomax is our current board president. Mr. John Walker is our vice president. Here this, this, this afternoon is Mary Hafner, Sabrina Rodriguez, and Jackie Moran. And then I am the interim superintendent for Ventura Unified School District. We serve approximately 21,656 students. 505 of those students are in preschool. 17,000, approximately 17,000 are in uh, transition K through 12th grade, and then 4,000 are in adult education. And so we go from infant to adults. 52% of our students are Hispanic, 44%, 40% are Caucasian, and 2% are African American, and then we have all of the other groups that are part of the additional uh, number, but they're less than 1% for all of these other groups listed. Home languages in our school district, 78% speak English, 20% speak Spanish, and then there are 39 additional languages that we serve in, in, in our district. And there's a long list of, of, of them. Approximately 25% of our student population are English learners. 54% of the population are eligible for free and reduced lunch. And so I, I don't know how many of you that reconciles with your vision of the community, but th these are the students that we serve in Ventura Unified. Facilities, we have 17 elementary schools and you can kind of see the list, but the, the thing to remember is we are the largest landowner in the city of Ventura. We have 350 acres of land and we service uh, 1,900,000 square feet of, of, of facility space. Some additional facts, uh, we have approximately 2,100 employees. Uh, we process an average of 2,450 payroll checks a month. Uh, and in 15, 16, we wrote payroll checks for over $108 million. And the reason I mention that is that most of that stays in this community and it, it goes to uh, the businesses in this community, the homeowners in this community. Um, we wrote over 19,250 checks to vendors and that should be, you know, you know, when you do a presentation, you see the error and other people don't. And you decide, should I tell, should I not? Okay. Um, the 37,730, $39,750,000, that, that's what that number should be in vendor checks uh, that we wrote in 15, 16. And uh, there were more than 5,150 vendor orders placed in 15, 16. And so we do a lot of a lot of business in this community and a lot of business in, in the state of California. Our general fund budget, um, and I have to get to my notes, so, and I never print these large enough, so if I've been down, then you know that I'm trying to read here. Uh, our, our general fund budget is $180 million in revenue. Uh, most of that comes from the local control funding formula, which is a state funding source, and you'll hear more about that uh, in, in, in the presentation. Um, it basically uh, gives us money based on average daily attendance and not necessarily enrollment. Uh, average daily attendance and we get a different uh, funding amount for grade levels uh, K through three, four and five, uh, six through eight and nine through 12. And then the state gives us additional money for uh, kindergarten through uh, third grade class size reduction and they also give additional money for uh, career technical education. Uh, school districts also uh, are eligible for additional funds based on the number of students they have that meet certain criteria. So if you have students that are low socioeconomic status, students that are English learners, or students that are foster students, we get additional funds for those students as well. In reference to expenditure, you know, we are a service agency and uh, our biggest asset in Ventura Unified School District are the people. We do our business with, with people. And so there's no surprise that 80% of our budget goes to the cost of those people. Salaries and benefits make up 80%. Uh, certificated positions are, are positions that require state certification to uh, have, and, and the classified positions are support staff for, for those positions.
these are the areas in Ventura Unified School District that I felt were, were at least worthy enough, and this was last week, to, to, uh, to, to, to talk about and, and present to you. Uh, and uh, district leadership change, I'm going to talk a little bit about the economic uncertainty that's facing school districts and, and most state agencies in California. Uh, accountability has been a theme for education for the last four to five years. I'm going to talk a little bit about Common Core and then how can business help school districts. Change. So two out of our five board members are serving in their first term on the board. Three of our incumbent members uh, have served 27 years, 23 years, and 11 years. Those of you that work with boards know that boards uh, establish their personality and their structure. So if you get one new board member, that's, that's a change. You get two new board members, that, that's, a, that's a pretty significant change in the board. And I'm not saying that it's good or bad, it's, it's, just, a, it's just a fact that, that you know, things, things will be different with that board. In addition to that, we will have a new superintendent. And so if you look at the hierarchy of the district, you have your school board, you have your superintendent. You know, those are the, the lead positions in the district. And so we will have a, basically a new board and a new superintendent coming in at the same time. And in addition to the uh, new superintendent, uh, there are uh, three additional executive positions in the district. There's a deputy superintendent of business services, an assistant superintendent of educational services, and an assistant superintendent of human resources. Uh, well, the assistant superintendent of human resources is vacant right now, so we will have a, a new superintendent, a new assistant superintendent of human resources, and also the assistant superintendent of educational services. She is in her first year with the district. And so basically the whole executive level team and the school board, they're, they're all a new team. And again, this is not to say it's, it's good or bad, but this is, this, this is, this is what it is. We also have several uh, additional administrative positions. We have a couple of director positions that we will be replacing. We have principal positions and vice principal positions within the district. And so uh, there, there, that's a lot of change. Now, I'm not saying this to alarm you or, or give you concern because the, the, the work that's done uh, in the school district is really done in the schools. And we haven't changed our, our teaching staff. We haven't changed, for the most part, the leadership of our schools. So the great work is going on. Things are going well. And we will continue to be a great organization through this change. But we are going through a change. And we felt it was important for the public to know and for uh, me to present this to you today. I want to talk a little bit about economic uncertainty. And, and this was a, a good graph that I felt to present because this represents the funds by source received by California schools. And it goes back to 1970-71 and it goes on to 2014-15. But if you notice at the yellow line is local funds and the red line is state funds and the blue line is federal funds. And so if you notice in 1978, around 1978, something happened uh, during, during that time. And I know that there are some educators in the room who can tell me what, what happened during that time, there was a court case, uh, Serrano versus Priest. And what happened was before that, uh, education was primarily funded by local funds. And so the community got together and they determined what they needed for uh, education and they would determine the, the, the level of tax they were going to uh, apply to property owners to fund education. Um, uh, during that time, uh, it was argued that that was unconstitutional for uh, people who are in communities of low socioeconomic status. What happens is uh, communities that uh, had means were able to have a lower tax rate than communities that did not have means. And so uh, it was determined to be unconstitutional. So at that point in time, the uh, main uh, funding for education went from local to the state, and the state became the, 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 main, uh, the main funder of education. Um, also, during that time, another thing happened is Proposition 13. And so Proposition 13 uh, came into play as well, which limited the amount of property taxes the state, uh, the, the, the amount of property taxes that homeowners could be charged, and it capped the increase in property taxes at 2% a year. So you can't increase by more than 2% a year. And so not only did it uh, not allow communities to, to uh, raise funds for schools, but it also limited the amount of property taxes that would come into the to, uh, to the state, and so uh, thus sales tax and all the other taxes went into place to, to, to try to replace that. But again, it put schools at the mercy of the state in terms of financing, and you can see how uh, the line is, is, is jagged. 
And so since 2008-2009, uh, this is the school's funding. Proposition 98 is the law that was put into place to supposedly uh, guaranteed a minimum amount of funding for, for the state. So in 2008-09, uh, we were being, uh, there was about $49 billion in state money applied to, to education. And then we went through the economic downturn. I don't know if you all remember the furlough days and all the other things. Uh, and then in 2012-13, Prop 30 uh, came into play and the state passed Prop 30, which uh, applied revenues to school districts. And our revenues have been increasing ever since. Now, this looks really good, right? I mean, this is not a bad increase in revenue. Uh, what, what you should know, though, is that California has really been below the state average. And what I forgot to say was, during the time that the property taxes were funded by local, California was number five in the state in terms of funding education. They were, they, were, they were number five in the state. So well above the state average in the top five. Um, this is California from 2001-02. The zero line on the top is the state average. And so California has been well below the state average for many, many years. We hit a low in the 11 and 12. Again, if we go back to this one, we hit a low here. We moved up, but we are still significantly below the state average of, of funding for schools. I hope that you can, you can see this. And so I thought this was a great slide to kind of show what uh, school districts are feeling in terms of budget and funding. Economic uncertainty, the full implementation of, of the local control funding formula, the slowdown in Proposition 98 funds uh, with the new federal government administration. We're expecting reductions in our federal funds as well. We've been proposed to have a 1.48% COLA, which does not cover the cost of increased inflation. We are experiencing the same things that other uh, public agencies are experiencing in reference to uh, retirement costs. Our, the district's contribution to uh, employee retirements, which is uh, state teachers' retirement system and public employees' retirement system, those rates have increased beyond uh, the increase in funding. And the state is proposing funding us at 96% and not, not 100%. And so that, you guys would agree that's economic uncertainty? Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, that's economic uncertainty. Um, California compared to the rest of the nation, we are uh, 41st amongst all states in spending per K-12 students, 37th among all states in spending as a share of the state's economy. We rank last in the nation in, in the number of K-12 students per teacher in, in, in classroom, and we're last in, or close to last in the nation in the number of students per staff. And even with this, we're, we're doing a great job. I mean, we're working hard, and we're doing the best with what we can, but, but just know that these are some of the pressures that California schools are, are facing, as well as Ventura Unified School District. I'm gonna move on now to accountability. There's a couple of things that happen in the state in terms of, of accountability. And so we have local control now in 2000. 12, the state changed the way it funds California schools. Uh, we had had a 40-year funding model, and they changed it during the 2012 and implemented 2013-14 school year, uh, where uh, things were, were totally different than, 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 than what they are now. But along with that change in funding came accountability. And so the, the state implemented a local control funding formula, which went away from the compliance model to more of a, of a, a, a empowerment model or a local control model where now the community gets to dictate the terms of most of the funds that used to be categorical or funds that came with strings attached. Um, the system is based on local needs. Uh, it, it, it's supposed to measure the process. Uh, along with the local control funding formula, we're required to do a local control accountability plan. And that, that LCAP, uh, basically we are supposed to uh, determine what our needs are. We're supposed to talk about how we're going to measure progress. We're supposed to set specific goals uh, for the uh, school district, and we're supposed to link the budget to those sp specific goals. So the LCAP's a critical part of the new accountability system. It's a three-year plan. It describes the school district's key goals for students. Uh, it is supposed to address the needs of students. And we're supposed to have a lot of community input. So we have LCAP committees that we have invited community to, to, to participate in. We have certain stakeholders we have to have at those meetings. We invite those to those meetings. But the goal is to set the, the direction for the community and for Ventura Unified School District in reference to meeting the needs of students. 
and they're supposed to address the eight state priorities uh, and the, the general areas of the state priorities are learning, conditions of learning, pupil outcomes, and engagement. So you have to hit all of those priorities in your uh, LCAP. Common Core, I just want to talk a little bit about Common Core. Uh, uh, the district is continuing to implement Common Core. Um, th there's been a lot of con controversy over Common Core. Some have felt it was a, a federal education plan, but in, in reality, it was the product of all the states getting together and trying to establish some common uh, expectations for education so that if a student should move from California to Arizona, there will be the same expectations in California as they, as they are in, in Arizona. The other thing that, that it, it went towards more is more critical thinking, uh, a different approach to, 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 to education. Uh, the speaker before me talked about the uh, students having to be ready for technology that has not been invented yet. And one of the ways that you do that is you have an approach to solving problems. You have a way of thinking through problems. You understand problems and you come up with, with solutions. So you're not just learning the how-to, but you're learning also the why. So on August 2, 2010, the State Board of Education voted unanimously to adopt uh, Common Core. Uh, but the thing that, that I don't know that people understand is that when you, uh, when you adopt new, new curriculum or new standards, then you have to write curriculum for those standards. You have to get the, the instructional materials to teach those standards, and you have to, to develop your assessments to make sure that um, you are making progress. And it was, and hopefully that's done when you implement, but when they implemented Common Core, none of those other things were done. And so they, they had not uh, uh, developed the curriculum yet. Uh, they We're just now uh, getting Common Core line curriculum, and, and we're in the process of purchasing that. And, uh, and, and the assessments have not been fully, fully developed yet. And so it, it is a work, a work in progress. Another thing that's new is the California Dashboard. The California Dashboard is a tool for accountability. It includes uh, state and local performance standards uh, for all of the eight priorities that I mentioned earlier, the local control funding formula priorities. Uh, it's also a tool for self-evaluation. It will assist us in identifying our strengths and weaknesses uh, and areas in which we need to improve. And it also establishes a process for using those standards for us to figure out where we can help students and what we need to do to intervene when students are not performing at the level that we believe they, they should. The state indicators for the dashboard are English learner progress, graduation rate, college and career readiness, academic indicators based on student test scores, and English language arts and math, suspension rates as well as devotion rates. And so those are the areas that, that uh, the state are gonna look at for schools. And if you go to the dashboard, you'll be able to see those areas for Ventura Unified School District. So the way that the state is going to indicate how you're doing is they determine a certain percentile or a combination uh, which determines a performance category is gonna be represented by colors and also it's gonna be represented by a pie. And so there'll be two things. You'll be able to either look at it by the colors and determine whether or not you're doing well, or you can look at it by how many slices in the pie you have filled in to determine that you're doing well. And there will also be a column to let you know current status, how you're doing now, if it was a change uh, from, from the, the, the previous status, and if there was a change, uh, and, and if the change was good or bad for more than, more than two years. And so this is the way that you uh, will be able to identify how schools are doing. Blue is good, red is not so good. A full pie is good, one slice is not, is not so good. And so if you go to this dashboard, you'll be able to look under the indicators that I read before and you'll be able to see these, in the, the, these particular symbols and determine how school districts are doing in these particular areas and also how individual schools are doing in these particular areas and also by each of the categories that I mentioned that I mentioned earlier. And so this is a, a picture of what the dashboard would, would look like. And so you see the pie, you see the status, and you see the change. There's three columns beyond the uh, title column. And as you can see in this, but and this is not Ventura Unified, this is just an example. It, it's so small when you put it on a slide for your school district, it, it's hard to see, so I use this as, a, as an example. And so for a suspension rate, uh, this particular uh, district is doing pretty well. In mathematics, K-8, they're not, they're not doing so well. And so this year, they were very low, and they declined. They declined by 
25, 25 points this year. And so you'll be able to look at the dashboard on the state website, see for California for a school district or for individual schools. Also, the dashboard has other indicators. Uh, they have local indicators, basic indicators in reference to teacher instructional materials and facilities. Are the schools implementing the academic standards? Is there parent engagement? And there are also local climate surveys. And, and most of this information comes from tools that the county or the school district has to, to evaluate. The district will receive one of the three ratings. You know, you'll either receive the, the met that you met the requirement, you did not meet the requirement, or you did not meet the requirement for two or two or more years. This is a, a chart that can be used to compare, to look at schools and see where they are in any particular indicator and also compare it to other schools. And so right here, section school four, school one, school five or six, they seem to be doing pretty good. School four is doing okay, but school three and school eight are not, not doing so well. And so you could look at a district under the different categories and see how they're doing in those different categories by school. If you want to look at the dashboard for yourself, uh, you can go to, uh, you could just type in dashboard and do a search and it'll come up. But this is a website that you can go in and you could type in the school district. You can do a search and you could go by school district or you could go by school and you can look it up for yourself. Okay, so how can businesses assist uh, schools? Uh, you know, I, I thought about this and, 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 um, and I want to add continue to uh, because some of the things and most of the things we're already doing, but we believe we need to do more. And one is, is to continue to collaborate with us. You know, let us know what your needs are and also give us an opportunity to, to tell you what our needs are. You know, we believe that we both can help each other. Partnerships, continue with partnerships. I, I spoke with one of the participants here today and, you know, we talked about the possibility of, of creating a, a career technical education pathway uh, in, in reference to the business that she's in with one of our high schools. Uh, work with us. Uh, we are looking for ways to, to make education uh, more practical and more real for students. And we want to expand our, our career technical education pathways. Uh, also, a way to partnership with us is through the Ventura Education Partnership. Uh, we have a foundation, and that foundation supports teachers directly. They give teachers the opportunity to do some of the things that they're not able to do with just the regular general fund, or they can do some things special, or they can go beyond. Sabrina Rodriguez is here, and she is our a VP president, and so we're always looking for people to partner with us and help us to support great ideas and great teaching. Uh, mentorships, you know, we, uh, we always look for ways to, again, uh, engage students in the real world uh, aspect of things. We, we, we also, uh, they also have to have people they can look to, that they can model themselves uh, be beyond or, or behind. And I, I remember the mentors I had growing up and. And I remember one guy, he looked so good, I changed my walk. You know, I'm going to walk like him. I'm, I'm going to stand like him because he was doing well. And, and so, you, and you never know, and it doesn't have to be uh, formal. You know, it, it can be informal. Sometimes it's just a little bit of your time. Yeah, and, and so we, we could always use that. The sharing of knowledge, you know, there's a vast amount of knowledge out here in, in, in this audience. And I know that we have connections where we share knowledge, but we're also continuing to grow, continuing to expand and continuing to learn. So as new initiatives come along, we may be reaching out to you and saying, can you come talk to our teachers about this? Can you come talk to our students about this? Can you show us how this works in, in, in your business? And so we would really appreciate that. Support, of course, we, we would appreciate your financial support. Uh, you saw the, the funding model and, and we are always looking for ways to do more. And also advisory, uh, there are times when we, we are stumped in some of the things we're trying to accomplish and some of the things we're trying to do. And so we need advice. We also have advisory committees and panels and we would certainly appreciate, you don't have to have a student in school to participate. We would certainly appreciate your participation in those things. And uh, adult education, we have a, a, a wonderful adult education department that, and a lot of people when they think of adult education, they think of, of night school and high school diploma, but we also have training programs. We also have career technical education programs in adult ed. So if you have some specific training needs, or if you're seeing that a lot of your uh, new employers are coming in with the lack of a certain skill, there are times when we could offer those classes for, for you and for your employees. And so, uh, you know, connect with us and, and we will certainly see what we can do. And then last but not least, you know, just continuing to reward uh, our successes. The Chamber has a wonderful program where uh, they reward a teacher every month and, and the value of that is immeasurable. 
Uh, you walk into a school, they don't know you're there, or they don't know why you're there. You come in and then you announce, you're here to announce the teacher of the month. The teacher's called up and then the teacher's showered with gifts, I mean, from, from the business community. And, and it really is a way to say thank you, send a message to that teacher and to the whole staff. And then in addition to that, uh, there's a raffle for more gifts, and so it becomes Oprah Winfrey Day. You know, you get a car, you get a car, you get a car. Everybody gets a car. Yeah. And so, so those are some of the areas that, that, that you, can, you can help us with. And so with that, I thank you for your time and your attention. Thank you very much. I think maybe we should go into the school district and talk about being a trash truck driver. They make a lot of money and they're their own boss. They know where they're supposed to go. They've got their own truck. They drive the same one every day. They get great pay and they're in the outside in their own atmosphere. Thank you very much. That was very enlightening. Next we have Dr. Greg Gillespie, who we want to say a big congratulations to because as you know, Dr. Gillespie was uh, recently appointed as the new president, chancellor, I should say, chancellor of the Ventura County Community College District. Well, Dr. Gillespie has been serving as president of Ventura College since the summer of 2013. He has worked for over 22 years in the community college system and has served as a faculty member, director, dean, and vice president at four different community colleges in three states with direct experience in instruction and administrative services and student services. Dr. Gillespie is focused on the college providing our community access to quality and reverent uh, educational programs and services. Dr. Gillespie grew up near Yakima, Washington and received a Bachelor of Science degree in agronomy, crop science from Washington State University and Master of Science and Doctor of Philosophy degrees in the same discipline from North Dakota State University. Dr. Gillespie. So it's great to see all of you here. I really appreciate you being at Ventura College today. And uh, you know, I really like the little dolphins on the tables, don't you? <laughs> Thanks to Channel Islands for that. Yeah, let's give them a hand. Yeah, so, oh, thanks. But you know, it makes me want to get little squeezable pirates to pass around. I mean, I think that would be good, yeah. You know, education is critical to opening doors for members of our community. And the exciting thing about the event today is that we have the people and organizations in the room to make education, to make social mobility, to make social justice happen in our community. Because when you look at a student starting in the K through 12 system, you know, our hope for them is that they get a job, they're able to take care of themselves, they're able to take care of their family, they're able to contribute to the economic development of our whole community. Education can't be successful if we're not partnering with the employers, with business and industry. And that's why I appreciate so many of you being here today and for so many of you being committed to helping us as educators do what we need to do to create opportunities for um, students in our community, both those that are coming through the K through 12 system as well as a lot of adults that are out in our county needing further education as well. You know, when you look at the value of education, the value of business, and how can we work together, you know, ultimately, what we'd really like to do is have a strong pathway from K through 12 to community college to the four year with stops out for meaningful employment all along the way there. So it really requires our businesses, our employers, to be willing to hire our students, to work with us to make sure that we're creating the relevant, timely, the technical programs and skills that are needed so that they're going to be valuable employees um, for you. Because, you know, when you think about it, it's much better if we can develop our own students, develop our own citizens to be taking the well-paying jobs that we have in our county here, and we want to work with um, businesses to make that happen. 
So in the time that I have, I do want to share with you just a little bit about some um, trends that are happening at Ventura College and then talk with you a little bit about our six-year educational master plan that we've just um, recently come up with. When we look at providing access to higher education, I want to mention that when you look at the students we're serving, the demographics have changed quite a bit over time. If you look at the past 20 years, you'll notice that when you compare the number of Hispanic students and white students, the trend is really reversed. When you go back to 1996, we had about close to 60% white students, around 30% Hispanic than other ethnicities um, making up the total. They were close to equal 10 years ago. Today, we have close to 60% of our students being Hispanic and around 30% um, white. And then again, the balance of other ethnicities. Our average student age has, increased, has decreased because we're seeing more students coming right out of high school to enter our programs. The number of students who receive financial aid is dramatically increasing. So, you know, we're serving students who are struggling more um, socioeconomically, either on their own or um, with their families. And the number of students who are first generation college students is also increasing. And this is a trend that's occurring across all community colleges across the nation. And here in California, any idea how many students are served by community colleges in California? Guesses? Selena, I'll call on you. <laughs> lots, lots of them. She's correct. There's about um, 2.1 million, so that's a lot. And when you look at community college students nationally, one in four students are students in California here. So we're a huge community college system having a tremendous impact. And community colleges are the route through which most students are able to access higher education. You know, I really enjoy working at community colleges because we're kind of right in the middle. We're there between the K through 12 system with the four year universities and then you have employers there. Community colleges are right in the middle to help make that connection to provide relevant training programs to move people into jobs, to move people into transfer. And what's exciting about that is we're doing that for individuals who are struggling financially, who are their first to go to college, and we're creating opportunities for students to move into the middle class that wouldn't exist if we weren't here. But it does take us working with employers to really make that happen well. The other thing that I want to mention about is just how we're doing with the number of students who enter here and actually complete. So when we look at the number of students who start at Ventura College and then what happens to them within six years with regards to getting a certificate or degree, you can see in the middle at Ventura College, 53% of students who start here end up with a certificate or degree within six years. The state average is 48%. Number five in the state, the number five college, community college in the state is at 62%. We rank 22nd out of 113 community colleges in certificate degree completion. Now I mentioned that we're getting our educational master plan finalized. This is a new six year educational master plan. And the overall component of the Ed Master Plan is simple. There's two real priorities that we have. One is to be in the top five in the state in about five student success metrics. So one of those metrics is certificate and degree completion. So we have a six year goal of being at this over 62% in five years in certificate and degree completions. Then we have initiatives that'll help us to do that. We'll also be looking at um, retention rates, course completion rates, and other important metrics. So that's one thing that's driving our EdMaster plan. The second thing is dealing with the concept of, of equity. So this just shows six-year completion rate by student ethnicity as an example of, of equity. And what this just shows that if you, for our black students, they have a 63% degree completion rate. Compare that to our white students, 57%, Latino, 
you can see if you're a Latino student coming here, you have a lower chance of completing a certificate or degree in the six years. And that's not acceptable for us. And, you know, a lot of community colleges, a lot of universities as well, the K through 12 system are working to address these equity issues. So in our educational master plan, our goal is to close these equity gaps in six years. And it can really happen when you look at what are barriers that are causing students to not be successful and then using our student support services, changing what we do in the classroom to help all students be successful because at Ventura College, at Moore Park College, Oxnard College, our goal is to make sure that a demographic factor, whether it's ethnicity, whether it's gender, whether it's age, um, any of those different factors, socioeconomic status, are not the determinant of that student's success. We want any student who walks through our doors is opening the opportunity that we provide to have that equal chance to be supported, to be successful. And that's a key component in um, our coming educational master plan. So I already shared about um, the goals around the educational master plan, those broad goals. And when we talk about being the top five in the state, closing the equity gaps that exist, that's great, but, but why are we doing it? Well, we're doing it because again, we want to do a better job at providing the social mobility for our students so that they're well prepared to transfer, to move into jobs, contribute to um, their well-being, and again, the economic vitality and growth of our um, community as well. The Edmaster Plan has five really broad goals. Um, in the student success area, we're talking about closing the equity gaps, and we have an, an initiative called Sale to Success. We use a lot of pirate-type themes, sea themes here, so we have fun with that. But, you know, Sale to Success, the goal of that is to have all of our students ready to have either completed or are ready to complete college level English and math after their first year with us. Eventually we want them completing those during their first year. You know, right now, 70% of our students come to us needing developmental English and or math. And, you know, that's fine. I, I mean, that's where our students are at and we need to meet them there and help them to get to college level. So our English and math programs are really working hard to accomplish that, and we're starting to have some great success already. But that's also where talking between the community college with our K through 12 partners on how to improve our articulation, um, talking about student preparation, looking at dual enrollment classes can also help having students be able to complete college level English and math during their first year. Student Advocacy Center is another important initiative that we're going to be starting. What that is, is it's going to be a center on campus that will actually have a social worker there to help our students who have a lot of barriers and challenges, have somebody who can connect them with resources that organizations provide in our community. About one third of community college students um, have food insecurity issues. We do a feed a pirate. Um, our associated students do that um, a few times a month to provide food to our students. The Advocacy Center will have a food pantry there. It'll also have a place where we'll have um, clothing and other items that people donate for students to use. Just under 15% 15 per, 15 of community college students suffer from um, housing insecurities as well. So anything that we can do to connect our students with some of those resources are going to help them be successful and help them achieve the dreams that they have for themselves. Pirates Cove, all right, that's another one that we're having fun with. And, and that's really something where any student who is struggling academically, they're able to go to the center, get connected with services they have, and it's kind of like a monitored study hall and tutoring approach. Uh, approach there. And then the Veterans Resource Center, um, we're continuing to get more and more veteran students and we really want to increase the number of veteran services and our ability to help them um, be successful with us. So that's just a little bit around the student success goal. With student access, this is an important one. We really want to expand um, access for everyone in the county to really be able to take advantage of classes that happen at 
Ventura College, Moore Park College, um, Oxnard College. So we're looking at expanding non-credit courses and this is something that you'll be interested in as employers. Non-credit courses are free. Um, they don't cost anything and we're developing right now non-credit programs that have ESL coupled with skills training, whether that be um, Microsoft Office Suite, some of those other types of things to provide English language development along with some career skill development. We also have non-credit programming available in the transferable or soft skills area and a broad um, component in technology fields there. So we're excited about um, those opportunities. Online education is an important way for um, a lot of students to be able to access education. The Strong Workforce Program is also one that's really relevant um, for, for us as a county and can really, it's going to help increase career technical education training. The state has provided about $250 million to community colleges to enhance existing career technical education programs and create new programs. So at Ventura College, we've added a, a diesel technology program that is completing its first year. We had a full cohort of students. It's doing very well. And that's a good example of how college and a business can work together. I think for those of you that were here last year, we had Gibbs Truck Centers. They were here, um, Ed Gibbs Jr. and Sr. because Gibbs Truck Center partnered with us um, in order to get the um, diesel technology program up and running. We have an agriculture program that's getting started this fall with transfer degrees in ag, ag business and um, crop science, um, the plant science area. But the strong workforce program requires us now as community colleges to not only track our students through degree certificate completion, but movement into jobs. So there again, the partnership with business and industry is important. And we'll be hiring a job developer here on the campus who'll be going out making connections with our employers so that we can help, um, again, make that connection from students who are completing a program to moving into jobs in our community there. So we're excited about that. And we'll also have a software system that employers and our students can engage in to help make connections in that area there. Dual enrollment with high schools is very important for increasing access. You know, I really hope that after the next two to four years, we're able to, through dual enrollment, have students in high schools being able to take 15 to 30 college credits while they're still right there in the, in the high school. So what better way to get that first experience with higher education, have some credits that then you can take as you move into community college and or move on to a um, four-year university there. And at our Ventura College Santa Paula site, we're looking to have a committed offering where students who really need to, if they only have access there in Santa Paula, they'll be able to get one of our transfer degrees in three years there. Community partnerships are critical. There's a number of things that we're working on and doing there. I, I just really want to highlight two off of this. I talked about our career center a little bit, but getting employer support um, for student job placement will be critical. And also working with us to provide internships and externships. If we can get students in the workplace so that they can be developing job skills while they're um, getting their educational work done. That helps them be better employees. It also helps them be excited about career areas and, and retain in school with us. Externships are things that happen on the faculty side. That's where we have a faculty member who goes out to an employer, might spend half a day, might spend a day just to learn what's going on in a skill area, in a business area, so they can come back and then incorporate what they learned into their curriculum so that our students are, are better prepared. But again, really appreciate business and industry involvement to help us be successful in training our students, educating our students for um, careers and, and moving on to the four-year schools. Goal four, institutional effectiveness. Making sure that we're constantly improving is something that 
we really need to do, not because accreditation requires it, and they do, but because it's the, the right thing to do as well. We have a Beacons of Success initiative, and that's just really changing how we work with students on the support side to make sure they're engaged, directed, and focused, and supported as they work through their programs with us. And all of the things that you see there are really, again, helping us focus on providing our students with the opportunity to be upwardly mobile, to be ready for a job, to be ready for transfer, and contribute um, as citizens in our, our communities there. And again, our students face a number of, of challenges. And you heard me talk a little bit about food insecurities, housing insecurities, and even you know, the, the ability to pay for the fees that it takes to go to college, whether it's the enrollment fees, whether it's the textbook costs. And one thing Ventura College has is the Ventura College Promise Program. The Promise Program covers the um, first year fees for a student who's graduated from a Ventura County High School, and that's operated through our Ventura County Foundation. But this is another area where business and industry can help because the Ventura College Promise works because of philanthropy, because we have people in the community who are willing to invest in supporting education and supporting the development and training of future employees. Our goal um, really at Ventura College is to move the Promise from being a one-year program to one that supports students through completion with a time limit, you know, might be two year, maybe three year. But the Promise program is important because because there is no cost there to the students beyond textbooks, a lot of them who would go part-time are able to go full-time. That helps them retain with us. It helps them um, complete faster as well. And, and as we look at some of our specialized area, nursing, automotive technology, agriculture, manufacturing, business, there's the opportunity that if you're interested to support a Promise program, it can be directed into specific areas where you're investing in your future employees there as well. So um, I, I really hope over the next few years that we're able to work across the county with our business and industry partners, with our city governments and, and other organizations to really have a countywide Promise program that a student can go to Ventura, Oxnard, Moore Park colleges. There, there is a strong national movement on these Promise programs. I think there's over 70 in California now, and a large number nationwide, where community colleges are partnering with different organizations, with state government, city government, to create free community college for um, students. And again, just think of the number of doors that that's opening up for people there. Under campus resources there, I just want to mention that in addition to our Ed Master Plan, we have a strategic implementation plan that really highlights all the initiatives that are going to help us accomplish the different things that we talked about there. But as I you know, mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, and this relates to that last bullet about leveraging resources through strategic partnerships, the people who need to be engaged in order to create opportunities for our students to enter education, be successful in it, move into a job, are here. So, you know, I look forward to the continued working with the VUSD, with Cal State Channel Islands, with our employers to really leverage the resources we have in a way that makes the greatest impact possible for us to create opportunities for students to have students achieve the dreams that they have and to be able to grow up here, have a good job here, raise a family here, and help support the economic growth and health of our, our area, because really that's what we're about. And if you're interested, you can look at our educational master plan um, online there as well. So I want to thank you for your attention and again appreciate you being here. Thank you very much, and good luck in your new endeavor as the Chancellor. Uh, our next speaker and last speaker 
is Dr. Erica Beck, president of California State University, Channel Islands. And Dr. Beck was appointed uh, to the, by the Board of Trustees on March 9th, 2016, as the president of California State University, Channel Islands. Prior to her appointment to CI, she served as provost and executive vice president at Nevada State College, uh, located in Henderson. She was there for six years. In this role, she provided leadership for academic affairs, student affairs, enrollment management, institutional research, and instructional technology. A native Californian, uh, President Beck holds a BA in psychology from the University of California, San Diego, an MA in psychology from San Diego State University, and a PhD in experimental physics psychology from the University of California, San Diego, where she also served as a faculty member a former research associate at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies. She has conducted research in the areas of de de boy, developmental psychopathology and cognitive neuroscience. Uh, in addition to her formal education, she actively engaged in the national dialogue regarding inclusive intelligence and the use of data to improve student learning. Um, she's a devoted mother of two, and President Beck enjoys running, yoga, perpetual conversations with her children about how many time, how many more minutes until we get there. <laughs> and I have to share one other thing. This is something that one of her staff members told me, and I truly believe it now. She is a dynamo in stilettos. <laughs> Dr. Beck. While she's setting that up, I actually, later in the presentation, was going to recognize a couple of our alumni, but it actually turns out that we have a couple of alumni here in this room um, that I was not aware of, and I don't know if Laura's still back there. There she is, look at that. So, so um, your lovely lunch today from the um, Traveler Cafe is um, owned, co-owned by one of our alums, Laura McIsaac, right there in the back, budding entrepreneur. <laughs> And, and her father, and he assured me that he really works for her. So I, I like Laura already. Um, and another who you actually um, saw briefly uh, earlier today is Jason Barnes, representing Congresswoman Brownlee. You never know when you might run into a couple of dolphins. Well, I'm really delighted to be the new president at Cal State Channel Islands. I've been on campus since August. It is a beautiful campus for those of you who have not been there. I invite you to come and say hello. And you will hear some repeated themes in my comments that really echo those of my colleagues. Um, and I will try to sort of um, skip past those. But I thought I would frame my comments with this quote from the Public Policy Institute of California. Some of you may be um, familiar with it, but as business and industry leaders, it's particularly important. If current trends persist, California will have one million fewer college graduates than it requires in 2030. One million. So in other words, if every college and every university continue to graduate baccalaureate degrees at the same rate we do now, we will be a million short of what our economy requires. And that's the why. Um, why we are having this conversation about increasing our graduation rates, increasing student success. There are many reasons um, and access to social mobility and the transformational power of higher education is critical, but our economy depends upon it. Uh, particularly in California, where we lead um, the world, in fact. Um, so it is very critical. Um, similar to the demographic characteristics that you heard from President Gillespie, our students are not the students that you typically think of when you think of college students even 20 years ago. Our students are overwhelmingly female, overwhelmingly the first in their families to attend college. Low income is indicated by um, Pell recipients and highly, highly diverse. Our students at Cal State Channel Islands, relative to the rest of the California State University system, and noted we have many CSU, overall CSU alums uh, in this conversation today, we are the newest campus, opened in 2002, um, and our students on average come to us less prepared for college work, similar to the remarks you heard from President Gillespie than the CSU average, both in math and in English. So they come to us with significant challenges. The great news is that we graduate them at a higher rate. 
than our peers. So when we have this conversation about student success and social mobility and how do we help our students to succeed at a higher rate than they are now, I'm really proud to be part of Cal State Channel Islands since we opened with this in mind. So unlike lots of institutions that are grappling with changing their culture and changing their campuses to really wrap their heads around these demographic shifts, we were established to address them. And so we are leaders. In fact, just last week, we hosted three universities from around the country. We were selected by a national organization to serve as a mentor university for these other universities because our data are so clear. That said, you saw my opening comments. We're going to be a million degrees short. So we have to do better. And so um, on our campus, we're really shifting the conversation from what the student does or does not do, what the student does or does not bring with them to campus, to what we as an institution must do to ensure equity in educational outcomes. And that's a different frame. Um, and it's a hard frame. Historically, across the country, universities, community colleges, all of our K-12 partners, we are all struggling with this equity issue. And the fact of the matter is that no one really knows how to solve it because we are blazing new trails and we are trying new things. And so on our campus, we are starting from a place of evidence. I'm an experimental psychologist by training. I appreciate the, the difficult uh, words, uh, <laughs> dialogue um, that are attached to that, but I'm an experimental psychologist by training. And so um, I live and die by data and evidence. Um, and so what we are doing is building a, a research and data infrastructure that will allow us to understand our students, and it will be different for different students, to understand how we can help them to be more successful. Starting with the question, if I was the first in my family to attend college, how would I navigate the complexities of this university campus? I have to pay my bill at a bursar's office. What is a bursar's office? If you've ever read your college catalog, <laughs> it's not the easiest reading material in the world um, and, a, and a course syllabus. So we're really trying to build things in a new way. And I often like to say that we're reimagining higher education for the 21st century. And I don't mean with respect to technology. I mean reimagining how we support our students in order to become successful um, and also not just join the workforce, but to lead the future of the workforce because as we know the workforce is under significant transformation right now think uber think amazon think instagram which is a part of my daily life now could not have imagined that um but things are changing so quickly and we need to prepare our students to be successful in that changing world we have really built out our degree programs hand in hand with many of you. I see lots of familiar faces and really built our university around the concept of a regional comprehensive university. And we take the regional piece very seriously. Our students overwhelmingly come from this area. They stay in this area. And so we intend to build degree programs that will help our region thrive. Um, there are lots of examples of this, significant um, teacher shortages, I, I, we hear about that a lot, nursing shortages, um, and we're very engaged in all of those. I um, wanted to tell you a little bit about our, our newest degree program that we hope to launch in fall of 2018, which is in mechatronics engineering. There are more than 300 engineering positions that are recruited for every year in our region across the board, but mechatronics is particularly cool. Um, it is the science of intelligent machines. So our students and our faculty are building drones, all kinds of drones and robotics, um, little teeny tiny drones that are, they're working on swarm algorithms for, for two reasons, I'm sure there are more. Um, one is to help support the dying bee population and the incredible impact of that on our agriculture community. Um, the other is that, you know, we really just have very low expectations of ourselves and our students at CSUCI. We're trying to enable um, travel to Mars. You know, and so our students were actually just competing in a NASA swarmathon you know, along the lines of swarm technology to help um, gather materials for return uh, trips from Mars. The university as a whole, people talk a lot about the private benefits of higher education. And I often say on our campus, we're not just impacting individual lives, we are changing family trees. And that matters. 
But it isn't just the individuals who benefit. We all benefit from an educated society. And that is why all three of us have spent our lives in public higher education committed to the, the idea of what does the public mean about public higher education. And it means that a, an educated citizenry is more likely to vote. They're more likely to volunteer. They have better health care outcomes, whole range of things. But there's also a demonstrable financial impact on the community. So this is actually data from 2010. One of the first things I did upon entering campus was to commission a new study so that we'll know what uh, uh, the financial impact of the university has, the university that was not here until 2002 on the community. And you will see the numbers here, extraordinary impact. And keep in mind, six years old data and we're almost twice the size that we were at the point that this commission uh, this study was commissioned we are the second fastest growing university in the nation to a master's degree so we are rapidly growing some of our extraordinary alumni you already met a couple of them some of some of you may have had lori's lemonade uh lori's lemonade is quite delicious in 500 different stores, just got picked up in Vons. Lori is one of our star uh, entrepreneur uh, students, doing very, very well. We're very proud of her. Matt Rejas, Matt is with the LAPD, helping to transform policing to the 21st century, very CI, in using social media to help engage in police practices. He's received a number of awards. And Sarah Gallagher, and Sarah is the CEO of FinGap, doing extraordinary things in our, in our community. So the question was, how can all of you help? The most significant challenge beyond the student success pieces, but really the fundamental challenge for us at, at Cal State Channel Islands, and this is true for public higher education in general, is that the um, decreasing support from the state. And, and this is a national trend and it occurs everywhere. For us in particular, we have many, many more students who apply to the university than we can accept because we do not have funding for them. So one of the things that you can do is to help advocate for the benefits of education in our community with our legislative uh, elected officials, um, both federally and in Sacramento. It's critically important and the future uh, and vibrancy of our community depends upon this. The other piece is all of you. So I was so pleased to have the opportunity to connect with you. Always delighted to have the opportunity to connect with business and industry. It is so important and historically it's something that we in higher education have not done particularly well. I'm really proud to say that CI has done a very, very good job of that. I intend to do more of it. We would love to have you involved. Those of you, some of you already are. Um, those of you who are not, you have my calling card. It's in the shape of a dolphin on your table. It's an unusual calling card. Um, we would love to have you engaged. Our students actually just won um, for the fourth year in a row the President of the United States Honor Roll for Community Service for being one of the universities in the country that um, students are engaged in the highest level of community service. They also engage in extraordinary amount of community-based learning and internships, and we also have business and industry leaders come to campus. We would love you to be involved with us. Um, we're very excited about the future. We're very excited about where it is that we will go. Um, we have an extraordinary opportunity to serve as a role model, um, not just for um, our region and not just for the Cal State University system, but for the country because every university in the country is grappling with these issues of how do we serve a population that we were never designed to serve in new ways with less funding. And that is a complex problem. But with engagement from all of you, we can find new solutions. And we've done a great job so far. far. We're nowhere near finished. We are just at the beginning. So we would love for you to participate. Um, would love for you to come out to campus. I really appreciate the opportunity. And um, I hope you don't have to use your dolphin stress ball anytime soon. Uh, but go dolphins. Thanks so much. Thank you to each of our speakers. I think that was some great information. And as the Chamber CEO, it does my heart good to hear relationships at the top of each of those lists on how we can get involved using our relationships in the business community to go back into the education you know, system and help them accomplish their goals. 
So I hope that each of you will think about that um, as you engage with the chamber over the coming months. Mr. Richards was very um, kind to mention our Teacher of the Month program. Um, that is concluding next month uh, with our final Teacher of the Month for this year. We will start back up in September. If you're interested in finding out more about the Teacher of the Month program, just give us a call. Um, there's also information on our website. We also have another program that um, I think will allow you to see firsthand what, what our educators are facing every day, and that's our Principal for a Day program. And that happens each October where we get a group of volunteers from the business community, and we partner with Ventura Unified School District, and we actually go into each school. We have a, a shadow volunteer uh, that kind of is the shadow of a principal in the school. They spend about half the day in the morning um, with those principals, seeing what a typical day is like, finding out what they're facing and what kinds of issues are going on. This last year, I was happy to serve in one of the schools, and um, it was on a day that they had a, a drill for um, active shooters in class. So that was a really interesting concept uh, because it was an elementary school. So they're dealing with five-year-olds all the way up to you know fifth graders. So. Very interesting. Uh, we'd love to engage you in that and um, certainly appreciate you being a part of this discussion today. I want to uh, give a few shout outs again. Thank yous uh, to each of our presenters, uh, Joe Richards, Dr. Gillespie and Dr. Beck. Thank you very much. We appreciate your information. And certainly would like to thank um, CSUCI for the great dolphin leave behind. Hopefully you'll take that back and it'll remind you to stay involved uh, throughout the year. Also. Yeah, don't throw them at anyone, although they probably wouldn't hurt too much, so maybe. <laughs> um, Ventura College, thank you for um, providing us with this fantastic space to meet. And um, also Ventura Unified School District for all of your support throughout the year. Um, Traveler Cafe, Tony and Laura, thank you very much. Appreciate the lunch today. And our fantastic partners at CAPS Media, Patrick and his team, do such a wonderful job of making us look and sound great, so thank you. And of course, once again, all of our sponsors and Chairman Circle members, uh, we so appreciate um, your engagement and your participation in the Chamber and certainly look forward to our next event. So with that, thank you very much for coming. And um, if you have any follow-up thoughts on how you'd like to get involved, please let me know and, and we'd love to engage with you. Thank you.